Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I have to tell you, um, I usually get so nervous before giving talks, but I called my husband before, um, before we gathered here today, and I said, you know what? I said, I have my nerve bugs that I usually have, but they're really, really good, and they're energizing because I feel like I'm with my people. And I am. And being with you all this weekend has just been the most inspiring and energizing and fueling experience. So I need to begin by saying thank you to you all and to everyone at YSC for all that you do, including bringing us all together. Today is International Women's Day, and I was thinking this morning, I have goosebumps even saying it, that there's no better place to be than with a group of people who are all about advocacy for women and for families, and so it's just, it's such a great honor to be with you today. I thought I'd begin by sharing a little bit of my story with you. On October 15th of 2010, I was awakened in the middle of the night with literally a stabbing pain to my right breast. I, now, I was a, a nurse who literally worked the night shift, which basically meant that I could sleep standing up backwards. So for me to be awakened was a really strange occurrence. But I didn't think anything of it and went back to sleep. Two more times that week, the exact same thing happened. I did an exam on myself, and I felt a lump. But as a nurse, I assured myself that breast cancer doesn't typically hurt. I had a history of dense breasts and accumulated cystic tissue. So I thought, that's probably what it is, but I'm going to have it checked out just to be sure. So I went to my gynecologist, and I had a full exam. And I remember so vividly, like it was yesterday, sitting across the table from her and saying to her, listen, I've done hospice, so I know what it's like to both deliver bad news and to receive it. So I want to know, do you think there's any chance that I have breast cancer? She said, absolutely not. But I want you to go get a mammogram and an ultrasound appointment, just to be sure. So I go to my appointment, and it's going along well. It was my first mammogram, and I was getting dressed, and I knew there was a problem when I was told that the radiologist wanted to see me before leaving. So I walk into his office, it was a little office, and I see images of my breasts on four large computer monitors. Now that was a place I never saw, thought that I would see the girls. So I'm looking at this, is that me? Really, is that me? In the meantime, he says to me, so I understand you're a nurse. And I said, yes. He said, well, that means that I can talk with you more frankly than I could someone else. I said, okay. He then proceeded to say to me, you have four tumors in your right breast and three in your left. We need to do a biopsy this afternoon for what I highly suspect to be breast cancer. In an instant, like so many of us, my world was shattered. I don't remember much from that conversation, but I do remember reminding myself as a nurse that people typically forget most everything that comes after the word cancer. So I said, you need to write down what you're about to hear. So I remember reaching in my bag for my journal and my hands were trembling. Very quickly, I found myself with a whole new perspective, moving from the side of the bed as a healthcare professional now into the bed as a patient. This transition introduced a whole new level of understanding for what the patient experience is like, both physically as well as emotionally. Everything from being stuck seemingly every other day with needles to contending with the very real and difficult feelings of sadness and anxiety, confusion, and fear. You know, as a nurse and a social worker, I had been trained to heal. But all of a sudden, that healing became incredibly personal. Shortly after my diagnosis, I found myself lost. 
as though I were standing in the middle of a dense, cobweb-filled forest. I literally had no idea which way to turn or how to proceed. Anybody else feel that way? Yeah. In a very short period of time, I gave myself sort of a, what I call a snap out of it moment. And I reminded myself that as a nurse and a social worker and a child development specialist, that there was probably no one better prepared to handle what I was facing. So my coping mechanism actually was sort of putting on my virtual scrubs and asking myself, how would I counsel a patient? Or more personally, how would I help a girlfriend? And it was these guiding principles that really helped give me the coping tools to be able to get through each and every day. As a nurse, there were lots of things that I came to know, both in my education as well as in my clinical practice. But when I climbed into the bed and became a patient, there were so many more things that I learned, really learned. The first of which had to do with making choices. I realized from the very beginning, knowing that I was facing a double mastectomy and reconstruction, six months of chemo, and six weeks of radiation, that things could become a little challenging. That ended up being the understatement of the year. But I decided from that moment, that very moment, that I had a choice about how I was going to handle every single situation, no matter how challenging. I chose to look for hope in what I called the silver lining. Now, the silver lining I knew wasn't going to take away things like nausea or vomiting, unfortunately. But I believed with every cell of my body that if I continued to look for hope, that I would be able to get through some of my most difficult times. The next thing I came to learn, really learn, was the importance of including children in the process, from the time of a diagnosis, throughout treatment, recovery, and then into this period of life after cancer. Children always know when there is a diagnosis in a family, when there is a change in prognosis, they always know. What I really came to learn is that when children are left to their own devices, their imagination has the capacity to create things that are far worse than reality. So as emotionally burdensome as it was to tell our daughter, who at the time was four and three quarters, and as we know, every quarter counts, that I had breast cancer, I knew that it had to be done. So I remember vividly preparing for the conversation, practicing the conversation that I was gonna have with her in the mirror. I sat her on my lap, and I told her that I needed to tell her some very important and difficult news. So I started by saying, I am sick. She lowered her head and she said, I know, in your boobies. Now note that I'm the child development person. I'm the pediatric nurse who knows that children can hear through walls, right? They absolutely can. And so I went to great lengths to not talk about anything that was going on with me while she was in the house, literally. And despite all of my efforts, she still knew. So I corrected her and said that boobies are called breasts, but that yes, I do have a disease called breast cancer. And I proceeded to explain to her using developmentally appropriate language what breast cancer is and a little bit of insight into what my treatment schedule was going to look like. Another thing that I learned with regard to children is the importance of empowering them. So when my hair started coming out, which by the way, to get even more demoralizing, it comes out in clumps, at least mine did, you know, piles on my pillow and my drain was clogged and it was just, really, could it get worse? Because I know my hair's coming out. And so I decided to shave my head. And I wore a wig for a period of time, but I ended up being much more comfortable wearing a scarf. This was actually my mother-in-law's scarf. Kept me feeling very close to her. 
So I'll never forget the first day uh, of wearing my scarf, and I walked into our daughter's preschool to pick her up. And all the moms are standing around, and they're in their, you know, their, their exercise clothes, and I walk in with my scarf. And my daughter's best friend, whose name is Greer, she is just rough and tumble. So she comes marching over, and she says, Aunt Hall, what's going on up there? And I said, Greer, my hair came out because of cancer for, or because of my uh, medicine that I'm taking for cancer. You knew about that. Yeah, I knew. But what's going on under there? And I said, I don't have any hair. So this dialogue's starting to go, and the kids are starting to gather. The moms are going, oh, don't go there. Please don't go there. Don't go there. So Greer, who is relentless, she's looking at me and she says, I'm going to need to see what's happening under there. <laughs> so our daughter, who was sitting in her teacher's lap, kind of, her eyes were really big. And I look over and I said, is it OK if I take my scarf off? So she nodded her head. I wasn't too sure that she was really confident about that. And I said, this is your choice. Is it OK if I take my scarf off? And if it isn't, Greer can come home after school and see. So she said, it's OK, Mommy. Take your scarf off. So I get down on, on my knees in the middle of the classroom, and I pull my scarf off. You would have thought that I was the lady in the park with a loaf of bread, because all the pigeons came over. <laughs> And they're all touching and feeling, oh, that's so cool. And how does that work? And why? And all this stuff. The moms, oh, oh my. I can only imagine the, uh, the dinner conversation that happened that night. Um, the important thing, the most important thing about this experience was that it gave our daughter control. In an uncontrollable situation, she decided. So any time I had the opportunity to give her a choice, about what was happening, I did that. Now, another thing that I came to learn was the importance of including children in every step of the process. So our daughter was fascinated with radiation. I have no idea if she's going to be a scientist someday or what, but she just wanted to know every single thing about radiation. So I was starting to feel a little bit better after chemo, and I thought, well, I'll invite her to come with me to radiation. Why not? So I asked my radiation oncologist if that was OK, talked to the team. Everybody agreed. So we go, and I got, you know, got my gown on and introduced her to the team. And we walk into the room, and I get up on the table. And as, as many of you know, the radiation rooms are really cold. So she got a warm blanket and put it on my feet. And, and then I'm laying there, you know, bare for the world to see, which I can't go to rodeos anymore because it just takes me back to that time when I was tied to the, tied to the table. And I just feel like the calf in the middle of a rodeo. So my daughter and the technicians leave, and I'm on the table, strapped down, going, did I do the right thing here? Because my five-year-old daughter is watching me get radiation. What was I thinking? What was, am I crazy? I no sooner had that thought than I hear, Mommy, you're doing great. Mommy, you look good. You're doing great. You're do don't move. Don't move now. Don't move. OK, all right, you're all done. I'm coming in. That gave me the most joy, because she was so excited about it. She got to talk into a microphone, and she got to see the machine move. And it just really reinforced the fact that including children makes a huge difference in their healthy, adaptive way of getting through this process that affects not just me or the individual, but it impacts our family, our friends, and our community. Speaking of community, from the time of my diagnosis, I knew how important it was to build a team of healthcare providers. What I really came to learn is how important it is to build a team of personal providers. So when it came time to building my team of healthcare providers, I literally I interviewed four different oncologists. Which, by the way, you know you're allowed to interview your doctors? It's not a given. You get to interview them. So something that was very important to me, having done hospice for a long period of time, was having a palliative care um, physician as part of my team. And palliative care, as I'm sure many of you know, is all about pain and symptom management. 
it's not death and dying, it's pain and symptom management. So I'm thinking, I'm about to have my breasts removed. There might be a little bit of pain. I happened to think that palliative care was gonna be kind of more on the bench for most of the time, but the truth of the matter was my palliative care physician during periods, um, especially after my surgery, when after my double mastectomy, I woke up literally glued to the ceiling because someone forgot to turn on my pain pump. Glued to the ceiling. It was my palliative care team physician, nurse, and social worker, who helped me not only right my ship, but also deal with the very, very horrific feelings of terror. You know, and I all of a sudden had this whole pain issue that I'd never had before. And they're also, by the way, palliative care, phenomenal at constipation which at times for me was the worst. I don't know if it was for you guys, but constipation at times was literally the worst side effect. So palliative care is great. Anyway, so I interview these oncologists and I say, well, I want palliative care as part of my team. So the first three oncologists said, oh, Holly, you're being dramatic. You're not dying. Your year's gonna suck, but you, you're not dying. You do not need palliative care. So I knew that I wasn't gonna hire them, obviously, and proceeded to educate them about what palliative care is. And then it was my oncologist whom I hired who said, every new patient of mine sees palliative care from the beginning because they are as much a part of the team as I am. In terms of the healthcare team, I can't overstate enough the importance of including all members of the team, right? So acknowledging the fact that talking with kids is one of the most difficult things and part of this process, there are people on the team who can help you do that. The dietitian, the chaplain, the volunteers. The cancer center where I went um, has the most phenomenal yoga instructor who, when I was in my worst place, came over to my house, house and did restorative yoga for me, which basically meant I laid on the floor and put my feet on the bed, but it felt really good. So engaging your entire team is so important. Now, when it came to engaging a team of people and providers to help me personally, I have always been, had always been, I guess I should say, the type A. Now, I got this. I can do this, no problem. I don't need help, no. And I really learned how important it is to include family and friends, acknowledging the fact that this disease happens to them as well, and they seek to identify their role in the process. And for me, the silver lining was, I had a husband who um, intercepted a lot of the calls and the emails, so when friends would say, we're gonna bring food, and I'd be like, no, I got this, no problem. And my husband would say, uh, yeah, bring food Monday through Friday, and if you feel like bringing some wine, great. That's fabulous, fabulous. So. What I really learned was how powerful it is to be able to engage our friends, our community, my daughter's teacher, my, one of my dearest friends, who would literally send me a text saying, I'm picking her up at school, I'm going to take her to the beach, I'm gonna run her like crazy, I'm gonna feed her, I'm gonna bathe her, and I'm gonna deliver her home exhausted and ready for bed, right? Talk about a major silver lining in my experience, and so, I learned, and this was so hard to me, in fact, it took, unfortunately, a cancer diagnosis for me to realize this, that asking for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. I'm gonna say it again because I repeat it to myself over and over again. Asking for help is truly a sign of strength, not weakness. Now, when it came to chemo, I was as sick as a person could possibly be. I spent most days literally in the bottomless pit of chemo despair. I hope that you all have not been there, but for those who have, you know what it, you know what it is. And it's awful, just terrible. Those days, I needed every bit of strength and energy to look for and to find those silver linings. What I learned 
the hard way is that silver linings come in small and in really big packages. Whether it was the perfect cup of ginger tea that eased my nausea just a little bit, or the hummingbirds that would be right outside my window on the days when I was too sick to literally stand. I remember one day in particular, I was literally so sick that I couldn't get just the few feet from my bathroom to my bed. So I laid down on my bathroom floor. And as I laid there, looking and feeling like a bald skeleton, I asked myself, really in a deflated way, where's your silver lining now? Because you're literally too sick to get just a few feet to that bed right over there. Where is your silver lining? I no sooner had that thought than my nearly 90 pound black Labrador named Buzz came waddling through the door. And as I'm laying there, he curled up into a little ball, well, as little as a 90 pounder can get, <laughs> right next to me. And I thought, there's a silver lining. About two minutes later, my husband came in. And instead of trying to carry me to my bed, which he could have done with one hand, he literally sat down and he put my bald head in his lap. The silver lining of this story was not that I could miraculously find the strength to stand up and walk to my bed. The silver lining of this story is that they both gave me the strength, the comfort, and the love that I so desperately needed in that moment. The ability for each and every one of us, uh, one of us to look for and then find Silver linings is one of the greatest lessons that I took from my experience. On my most difficult days, I knew that if I looked for a silver lining, there would be one. Now, as I said before, it doesn't take away things like constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, things like that. It does not do that, unfortunately. But silver linings provide balance, perspective, and hope to get sometimes just from one moment to the next. What I now know with absolute certainty is that each and every one of us is going to face something in life. For most of us in this room, it is breast cancer. But I have to tell you, there's probably going to be more. It's life. In these difficult circumstances, we all, each and every one of us, has the ability to look for a silver lining. And you call silver lining whatever you want, hope, prayer, whatever it is, but it's whatever it takes to get you from one moment to the next. The thing about silver linings was that they didn't and don't take away the rain, sometimes the downpour with hail, that often came throughout my treatment. But what they did is they provided me literally with an umbrella to help me get through. So now, when I'm having a cruddy day, frustrated, aggravated, grumpy, whatever it is, I really look for silver linings. I remember one day last week, my husband came in and I was in a, I was in a mood, I was grumpy, and he came in, and I it just, ah. and, uh, and I told him, I said, I'm grumpy. He said, well, what's wrong? I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I'm just, I just, I've got too much going on. I'm blah, blah, blah. He said, where's your silver lining? I'm like, oh, enough with the silver linings already. I look for him every day. He's like, all right, I'm going to help you out here. You're not going for chemo today. Hmm, that's a good one. Oh, you don't have a JP drain today. Oh, there's a silver lining. You're not going for radiation there's a silver lining. And what we did was we keep, kept coming up with other really positive things that were a part of the day. Now, 
they didn't take away that grumpy feeling or when I was sick, the feelings of sadness and confusion. Those are incredibly real emotions that need to be processed. This isn't about burying, because that stuff's just gonna come up. It's about helping to live with those difficult emotions, no matter what we face in life. Whether it's a diagnosis, job loss, divorce, addiction, whatever life throws at us. Traffic. Sometimes I'll literally be stuck in traffic in California, and there's a lot of it, by the way. And I'll say, where's my silver lining? I need some silver lining. I do. I remember one time, the, um, I was so excited that I was going to um, drive to my oncologist's appointment by myself, and I didn't want anybody to go with me. And I was driving home, and I forgot where I lived. Literally forgot where I lived. It was like, panic. I didn't know which exit. I didn't know. I had, here's the silver lining. I know my address. And here's the silver lining. I have a GPS system. So I plugged my address in, and I listened to the lady tell me how to get to my house. That was the silver lining. And that is the essence of silver linings. Again, little packages and in big ones. And each and every one of us can and will find them. All we have to do is look for them. One of the greatest silver linings for me is being able to help people who have to follow me down this path, just as those who came before me made my experience more bearable and more effective. In your goodie bag, each of you has this book. This is a condensed version of my original book. It's the book that I truly wish that I had when I was going through this experience. I wanted something that was clinically credible, written by a healthcare professional, but also supportive. I wanted something that was honest and informational, and I wanted something that was beautiful and who could serve as, that could serve as, a, as a girlfriend, as a lifeline in the middle of the night when I was up with roared rage and hot flashes. And that book simply didn't exist. So I published it last year. And one of the most important things for me was that this book get into the hands of everyone who was impacted by the disease, not just by the people who could go online and order it. So I talked with my husband about my big idea. And we went to a couple of different corporations. And Allstate Insurance said, yeah, this is a big idea, and we like it. We like it. We like it because we are advocates for women. We're advocates for family. We're advocates for health care. We're not trying to sell another policy. We do home and auto, so we don't even know anything about health insurance. But we believe that each person needs access to this information. So I created this condensed, truly companion guide to serve as a companion and also a companion to the, to the bigger book. So I'm so grateful to um, YSC for distributing it here. And the important thing um, for you to know is that it's absolutely free of charge. Allstate Insurance is uh, partnering with me to ensure that every person who is impacted by the disease gets a copy of this book. I had the great opportunity to, to go on Good Morning America and sit with the CEO of Allstate and Robin Roberts, which by the way, Robin Roberts, she's as cool as you would imagine. She's unbelievable. She's so great. I just, you just want to hug her. And she's so huggable. Anyway, she got it too. She's like, Holly, I know. You, we need to get this out there. And the CEO of Allstate said, we're doing this not to sell a policy, but because it's the right thing to do. So I need your help distributing it. Take it to your cancer center, a chemo infusion center. Take it to a hospital. Take it to a, a cancer support um, entity in your community and let them know that this is free. There are no strings attached. The sole purpose of this companion guide is literally to help people who have to follow me and all of us down this path. And until there is a cure, that equates to over 250,000 people each and every year. 
So please, help me, help all of the other people who are impacted by this disease. And I hope that each and every one of you, if you take one thing from this talk, is able to look for a silver lining in your life. A big one, a little one, look for a silver lining. Try to incorporate hope into your, your life. It will truly provide the balance and perspective to get you through the most difficult of circumstances. Thank you all so much 